I've seen your pop before. Haven't seen you. Took it legal. Previous owner was dead and a tiller when I found it. You had another hour before I cleared it up again. <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute presents Waterworld, H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 5 and 6, which begin with Lime Thievery, and it ends with a drifter explaining himself at the business end of a harpoon gun. When we wrapped last week, we had our eyes on the depth gauge, and I said, I don't want to talk about it this week, I want to talk about it next week. So here we are. We're going to start off right with that, because when we first see the depth gauge, it is rising up, and it is passing the 400-something mark. That was going to be my question, is meters or feet? So it's my belief that the depth is measuring in feet, because in 2016, New Zealand freediver William Truebridge set a world record by diving 124 meters, which is 406 feet below the ocean surface, in Dean's Blue Hole in the Bahamas, without the assistance of fins or weights, which the Mariner is diving without fins or weights. Now, if the gauge was measured in meters, then the Mariner would have been diving down more than 1,300 feet to reach the end of that line. Now, the deepest that I was able to find a human going while free diving was Herbert Nietzsche in 2007, who used a weight to pull himself down 214 meters or 702 feet and then he used a buoyancy control device to convey himself back up to the surface so this is people operating just lung capacity down and up in one breath okay i really like that logic and right now in the movie that is normal Mm -hmm. it's on the extreme side of normal but it's still normal people can do that But we, you and I know, that he is not normal. Right. So while he can breathe underwater, there's also the issue of pressure. Exactly. And the speed at which he comes back up. You can't come back up too fast or you get the bends. Well, like I mentioned back in episode one, Norman Howell, Costner's stunt double, he nearly died of an embolism because he came up too fast. Yes. Sure, the Mariner has gills, but he still has a heart and a pulmonary system. And... I would have to look it up to be sure, but the Benz is about the blood. It's about... Too much nitrogen, I believe. Yeah, it's too much nitrogen in your blood. So he still has blood. So I think the limits of the human body, while his body is not entirely human, still apply. Plus, if you go down too deep, the light of the sun can't penetrate. And so eventually you just go into utter darkness. Now, I kind of want to leave this discussion on the table... For way down in the movie when he takes Helen down there. Down in the diving bell. Yes, in the diving bell. So we'll think about that as far as light is concerned. I know it's weird to think of a gauge measuring something in feet because he's probably sourcing things from international sources. So it makes sense for them to be measured in meters, but it is what it is. I'm going to agree with your statement, but I'm also going to point out that nautical people measure things differently. Yeah, that's true. In general. So I think it's entirely possible that depth gauges traditionally come in feet rather than meters. Something I just realized it might also be worth remembering is that I don't know if this gauge is necessarily measuring depth to the bottom. It could just be measuring the length of the line that it's let out and that it is drawing things back in. So even if the line is 400 meters long, It's 400 meters long from the boat out at an angle to the bottom of the ocean because it's pulled out at that angle. So to figure out how deep he actually is, we would have to do some geometry. Oh, I don't want to do geometry. Don't make me do it. Okay, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to make you do math. (laughs) This is not the mad math minute. But it's simple geometry. It's the Pythagorean theorem Mm -hmm. where C squared would be the 400 because that's the line that is angled. So we would just need to know one of the other two, and we could figure out the third one. 
<laughs> just saying it's simple math for people who care to do math, mm -hmm. which is not us. Yeah, because even if you want to solve for one of the sides, you'd still need one of the other lengths. Yeah. And we just don't have it. But getting away from high school math. The very next thing that happens is that the limes get stolen by mystery hands mm -hmm. off the tree. So a couple things. This does feel a little Chekhov's gun-esque where we saw the lime tree and immediately the limes get stolen. It feels fast, though. It feels like a sped up, simplified version of Chekhov's gun. If you show a lime tree in shot number one, by shot number three, the limes have to get stolen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's the same thing with the pee. If you show someone pissing into a cup in scene one, then by scene three, he's going to drink the piss. <laughs> Five minutes in, and this movie is very formulaic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But my second thing is, why doesn't he just take the whole tree? Yeah, that's a very good point. If you're going to steal stuff off of a boat, and you see a plant growing fruit, and the plant is movable. Yeah. Take the whole not? thing. Even if you're not interested in cultivating it so that it will grow limes again for you, mm -hmm. which is understandable. It's a lot of work and it could be years before it bears fruit again. You could eat the leaves. You could sell it. That whole thing is full of dirt, which we will see later is very valuable. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of value to that tree. Exactly. And, and he it's steals not bolted just down. the limes. It is not secured to the boat in any way. It can be picked up and moved. Yeah. Unless there's some sort of fastening happening underneath that plant that I'm not seeing. There might be, because it is on a rounded surface, and mm -hmm. it doesn't move. Like, it doesn't fall off. It wobbles some, but does not fall off. It is a weeble. <laughs> so I suspect it might be chained down. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, seeing another pair of hands... We were not shown that there was specifically someone else on this boat before the Mariner went under the water. So first time viewers can very easily believe that, okay, this is someone who should not be on the boat. This is a lime thief that has just come out of somewhere. It was very well telegraphed to us that he is alone. Mm -hmm. We would have seen someone else during the sequence where we were just fading between shots. Mm -hmm. But what we weren't shown is the surrounding area. Mm-hmm. I think it was Wendover Productions did a video about how far you can see. Yeah. And the average man at like 5'8", we're talking like a couple of miles, like yeah. three and a half miles is the like average that you can see. So increase that maybe because he's up on top of the boat, but this mystery person didn't actually have to be that far away to be out of sight. There are additional factors like the height of his boat for like his sail to be seen. Mm -hmm. But I think all told, it's not going to be much more than, I don't know, maybe six or seven miles away. So well within the possibility of sailing up on this situation where they were far away before he went into the water and then there's plenty of time for them to sail up. I find that very plausible. <laughs> there's a time frame that we just don't know that we're yeah. going to have to deal with. Yeah. We cut underwater real quick to see that there is a lifting bag pulling a bunch of stuff in a cargo net. The lighting underwater does not do a good job of showing exactly what is in the bag, but I also don't think we really see this whole net get pulled up in later chunks of the movie. No, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this bag is an issue coming up in the next few minutes, correct? Oh yeah, the lifting bag yeah. is the whole reason that we see the boat transform. Whatever he went down there to get is getting hauled up by this bag. Okay, so his haul is in the bag. Right. But as he boards his boat, he throws a pair of ski boots on ahead of him. Mm -hmm. So they weren't in the bag. No, he probably brought them up himself because as the bag breaks the surface, if you look in that shot off to the left, you can see little splashes of him surfacing and throwing boots up onto the trimaran. So right. he probably found them separate from the bag after he'd filled it. Maybe he was on his way back, and he's like, ooh, boots. Exactly. Because when you think of things that would be at a premium in the post-apocalypse, shoes seems like a big one. Outside yeah. of flip-flops. 
(laughs) (laughs) I think shoes in general, yeah, because shoes take a lot of wear and tear. Mm -hmm. And we know this is hundreds of years after the flood. So they barely have cloth. It's so worn out. Yeah, any cloth they have would be used for sails, and any scraps of cloth they could get from after that would be sewn together patchwork style into whatever clothing they're wearing. And Mm -hmm. there are very few people in this movie that have whole pieces of outfits. Now that we say that, it's a miracle there's any cloth left. I know, right? I wonder if there was ever any diving by regular humans, not hybrid humans like we have with the Mariner, to pick off what was accessible. Back when submarines were more of a readily accessible thing, because there are research submarines that go down specifically to bring things up. Right. And there's the free divers that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. They go quite deep. Mm -hmm. And there's also oxygen tanks and pressure suits that allow people to go very deep. So I wonder if there is a certain depth level that it's picked clean by the first round of people who were desperate. I would like to think that as the world slipped underwater and more and more people were displaced, that the idea of getting large shipping boats and setting up like farmland on deck. Yeah. Like when you think of the Exxon Valdez and how much real estate on top of that ship is just wasted, it's pretty egregious. (laughs) It is. My biggest question is, where are all the cruise ships? Exactly. Like, that's housing for a lot of people. There are kitchens where you can cook. There are open spaces where you can house livestock and farm. I'm so curious about the transition between a ground-based society to a water-based society. Mm -hmm. It wasn't overnight. In real life, it would take hundreds of years to make that transition. So if we know it's going to happen and we don't do anything to stop it, which would be ridiculous, we would have enough time to prepare Mm -hmm. to build barges specifically meant to farm on and load them up with dirt and livestock that could then produce fertilizer so that we can grow things. Like, How did we not prepare for this? Were we so blind to climate change that right up to the very end, We were like, no, 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 nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Oops, there's no land left. That's the wisdom of setting this movie an indiscriminate amount of time in the future. It's just (laughs) like the first Mad Max movie where it says sometime from now. Yeah. Here it's just the future. We don't know exactly how people handled when the world started flooding. They could have done all of the things that we mentioned, but it's just been so many hundreds of years that all of that stuff has gone away. There's a line later on in this movie where the deacon is complaining about how there used to be atolls as far as the eye could see. And one of his underlings is like, yeah, but we sunk them all. (laughs) So we destroyed the world that we built up because we destroyed the world we had. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) And another thing that points to a significant passage of time is that the Mariner has gills. Exactly. That's evolution. That's adaptation. That takes many, many generations, many, many generations. And even if it's accelerated by technology or dire necessity, it still takes a very long time for stuff like that to happen. I think one of the major distinctions that this movie makes is that the Mariner's Gills are a mutation as opposed to an evolution. That yeah. They are an anomaly. They are something that shouldn't be. And we'll get into it later on, but I don't know why they're so adamant against him being a mutant. I just don't get it. Okay. When it comes time, we may have to talk about X-Men. Okay. Sounds good. We'll put it on the shelf for now. Dang it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So the important thing is that the Mariner has found shoes. I do particularly like that they are ski boots because that's what you would find on a mountain. And Mm -hmm. a mountain would be the easiest place to access. Exactly. So they're very appropriate. He's probably finding a lot of his stuff from old flooded ski lodges. Mm -hmm. So think of all the things you usually find in a ski lodge. That's probably the things that are probably going to be found first. Like lighters. Exactly. Because 
what else do people do when they're hanging out in a lodge? Smoke. Bef- you know, before all the places said you can't smoke inside. Which yeah. <laughs> good. I, I don't like smoking. So uh, it's just me. I enjoyed his reaction to finding the lighter. I think it pointed out a certain level of cleverness on his part, which has already been established. We know he's smart and handy, but he figures out pretty dang quick where he is supposed to flick. It just doesn't work because one, it's waterlogged and there's probably no fuel left in it anyways, but he figures it out. There's a cool little thing you can do with those old Bic flick lighters. You can take apart the top and there's the striker wheel and then there's like a little piece of flint that is spring loaded to go into the striker wheel is you can take that piece of flint and that striker wheel and you can make yourself a little fire starter by just taking those two elements and fastening them to a different housing Mm -hmm. so that you essentially have this little stick and you just have a strike wheel to produce sparks to light stuff with i saw an instructable or something like that yeah how to repurpose a lighter because I was trying to figure out, okay, what is this part called? And where exactly is the flint on a striker wheel? I think it's called a spark wheel instead of a striker wheel. I'm probably calling it the wrong thing. <laughs> it's okay. We're not lighter experts. Exactly. Before we get too far away from it, what did you think of that forward roll that the Mariner did to get out of the water? Oh, it was so awesome. It shows a in syncness, a connectedness with his ship. Mm-hmm. That really points to this is where he lives all the time. This is not an excursion from his home base. This is his home base. He is completely familiar with the ship. He is completely accustomed to living life on it. I thought that that flip, it told us a lot about the environment. It also saved him the embarrassment of having to drag himself completely up out of the water to stand on that hull and then awkwardly pick his way across the netting to then sit down. For Kevin Costner, that was a blessing because nobody looks good clamoring out of the water like that. Nobody does. And it's also energy conservation for the Mariner. Mm -hmm. We get our first real dialogue in this minute, right? We do. Yeah, the Mariner is about to put on the second boot and he hears something clanging. It's probably like pots and pans or something. And he turns around and he sees the other boat. And he instantly goes into, oh no, something's wrong mode because he rushes to the front of the boat, which is called the bow. Yep. Yeah. We're slowly going (laughs) to learn all of the parts of the boat, what they're called. So he goes to the bow where he's got a harpoon gun and he's got a nice little fabric towel thing thrown over it and he whips it off. And I know I mentioned last time That, oh, this is clearly a different shot from a different time with the canopies that we saw by the harmonica get up. But when he rips off the fabric and we see the low angle of him on the harpoon gun, every low angle of him on a harpoon gun is so obviously shot late in the day that it's a bit painful to look at because it's so freaking obvious. Oh, yeah, that sun is quite a bit lower. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of George Miller. (laughs) It doesn't matter what time of day it is as long as the shot looks good. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) So the Mariner whistles to this guy and he raises a hand and he shouts out in this language that is not English. And it is described in the subtitles as Greek. And it's described here as Greek, and it's also explained later on in the movie that this is the language of traitors. Not traitors, but traitors. Okay. And he's reassuring the Mariner that he did not board the Mariner's boat. So this guy is just known as the Drifter. And he has a fairly small part in this movie because he's just here in this opening scene. But we've got a new face. Do we want to meet him? Yeah, bring it on. All right. So his name is Chaim Giraffe. He is best known for his role in this movie, Waterworld. He's also known as the dry cleaner in Just Like Heaven from 2005. He is Mustafa in 1988's The Beast of War, and he is a character named Ali in an episode of Quantum Leap in 1992. Chaim Jarafi is an Israeli actor who got his start in Israeli film and television with his first credit being Rechav Sumsum, which is Israel's Sesame Street, which was in 1983. I will say now, I'm not good at pronouncing Israeli things. So yeah, there's that. 
Girafi moved on to American TV and cinema in the 1990s. He played a lot of typically Middle Eastern roles, Arabs, Israelis, Turks, generic Middle Eastern types. But notably, he was on two episodes of Seinfeld as the shady owner of the Jiffy Park parking lot in The Wigmaster. And he was also the Jiffy Dump Trust Depository guy in Muffin Tops. He was also on episodes of Murder, She Wrote, the episode of Quantum Leap that I mentioned earlier. He was also on CSI Miami and the two films I mentioned, Waterworld and Just Like Heaven. Okay. There's something about his face that looks familiar. So I was kind of waiting for something to pop out at me. Mm -hmm. Nothing really did. I've seen stuff. You know, I've seen Seinfeld. I've seen Just Like Heaven. I've seen Quantum Leap. But... I don't think that's why he looks familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So I can't place him. I really like the drifter in this opening scene because he gives off the air of lightness, but also shadiness. He's shady, but he's very casual about it. Yeah. And very genial. Mm -hmm. He's smiling the whole time. Yeah. He's got this nice, bright white smile. So, you know, you look at him and he looks like a guy you could have a good time with. Yeah. And I think one of the things that sets us off as viewers initially is that the first thing he says is, I didn't board you, which almost seems a little too suspicious. I guess He's... that's just what people assume on Waterworld. I would think so. I think perhaps it speaks to the nature of running into people out in the open waters, that there is a suspicion and a defensiveness that is natural and is automatic and is therefore... Not offensive. In our society, if we went out our front door, saw our neighbor walking their dog, and they immediately said, hey, I didn't come in your house, we'd be like, well, now I think you did. Yeah. But in their world, it's a more normal statement mm -hmm. and a less suspicious statement. <laughs> so as we see the bag bobbing in the waves with the drifter between the bag and the mariner, we get to see the subtitle where he says that you were down there a long time and the mariner probably having this as a rote explanation says that there are holes in his hull that are so big that there is room to breathe it does seem in his specific circumstances that it would be a good idea to have something prepared yeah no matter how infrequently you need to use it this lifestyle is dangerous enough that yeah you should have a good reason ready to go mm-hmm but hearing the Mariner speak this Portuguese, the drifter very quickly switches over to English, probably because he realizes that the Mariner's accent is not suited to something <laughs> that's not English. <laughs> it's funny because Kevin Costner and accents, yeah, no, no. There's a lot of attention brought to, especially um, Prince of Thieves, about the whole accent thing. And I'm totally fine with it because... Kevin Costner's voice is Kevin Costner's voice, and that's just all there is to it. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. It's fine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I don't need him to attempt other things. It's just Kevin Costner's voice. Yeah. So the drifter goes on to give us a bit of world building. He talks about slavers that are producing good grade epoxy and that it may cost him a handful of dirt. So already we are shown that there are slavers in this world going around kidnapping people, putting them to work. They are producing things. They are not just scavenging off the ocean floor like the Mariner. There are actually people making things and that dirt is a good way to trade for stuff. But also he mentions the wind chime with all the sprockets and things that was blown around in the fading shots. So we're back to bartering. We are. And it's an interesting system. The bartering system, it stresses me out because it's so subjective. For example, a handful of dirt. Well, to me, a handful of dirt isn't worth anything. If somebody tried to trade me a roll of toilet paper for a handful of dirt, that just wouldn't really mean anything. But to them, it means everything. And that subjectiveness kind of makes me uncomfortable because... The economy is such an important part of our lives and our society, and even to them. I mean, their economy is completely different than ours, but 
to them, it still means life and death. Yeah. Think of all the things you can do with a handful of dirt when you exist on a world that is completely covered in stuff that is not land, a.k.a. water. Like, when you think of the Fallout series of video games, the currency that they use in that world are bottle caps. And the way they came about that system is that one bottle cap would equal one bottle of water. And so it's a water-based currency system. And over time, they just got to the point where instead of trading bottles of water, you just traded bottle caps to represent that value. Interesting. I never knew that. Yeah. Interesting. You and I have been on a binge of watching Community. Mm Mm-hmm. There's an episode that is centered around chicken from the cafeteria, and everybody wants this chicken, and there's never enough. So the study group takes over the production of the chicken, so they control that, and they begin bartering this chicken for other goods and services. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have something that they want or need, you don't get chicken. Yeah. That makes me so nervous. That you just won't have something to barter with yeah that i won't have anything to barter with and in that case it's chicken who cares but what if it were something more important what if it was clean water and i don't have anything to barter with yeah then i'm gonna die (laughs) this is why it stresses me out well this is why i don't want to survive an apocalypse (laughs) capitalism in general is a stressful situation it is yeah and speaking of stressful situations The Mariner is incredibly stressed out by this because he does not trust this Drifter at all. He's asking him, what are you doing here? And the Drifter says, just waiting. And he starts preparing to sail. And I think the Drifter would like to get away as fast as possible, but the Mariner is definitely in a, I need to figure out if you took anything from me mode. Yes, he's definitely very suspicious, very, I was going to say defensive, but he's on the offensive He is pointing a harpoon gun at this other boat. Yeah. A boat that the Mariner says he has seen before, but he's never seen this particular drifter. And the drifter has to specify that he took it legal. He found the previous owner of that boat dead on the tiller when he found it. Do you think that's at all true? I think it's incredibly plausible. So do I. But we also know that this guy boarded the Mariner's boat. And stole from him. Mm -hmm. So is he to be believed at all? Like he could just be a one man pirate crew going along from boat to boat to boat, trading up as he goes. He says, you had another hour before I traded up again. And he's got a joking tone about it. But I think if the drip timer hadn't gone off and the winch hadn't started pulling in, then he probably would have just tried to take the boat as soon as he found out that there was nobody on it. I don't think he was necessarily waiting for hours. Yeah, because he doesn't take the limes until after the timer and the winch start doing their bringing the stuff up thing. So he may have already been on the boat, already preparing to take it Mm -hmm. when that happened and spooked him. So he took what he could and left. Yep. He's so open about admitting that he was willing to steal his boat. This feels very societal. Yeah. Like, that's okay. If you find a boat that is abandoned or everybody on board is dead, it's fair game. Yeah, like, why wouldn't you? It would be wasteful not to. Exactly. There's no luxury to stand on ceremony in a post-apocalypse. Just like with the pee, filtering it out and reusing it for something else. Mm -hmm. There's no wasting anything. Even if something doesn't work, like the lighter. Even if it doesn't work as a lighter, it doesn't do anything. He's not going to throw it away. He keeps it the whole time. Yeah. Because, I don't know. In this post-apocalyptic situation, the guy with the trash barge is probably the richest guy in the area because he just has so much stuff. Yep. And as we see throughout the movie, the Mariner, he's got it really good. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it's because of his random crap. It makes you wonder what kind of situation the Mariner came from. Like, he's alone on the boat now. But was this boat specifically built by him? Was it handed down to him? Did he find it? Like, everybody has parents. That's just how it works. It takes two to tango, so to speak. And most likely, his parents had the same mutation he did. At least one of them. It's possible, yeah. 
and they probably lived on this boat before him. Their parents probably lived on that boat before them, handed down generation after generation with each generation adding something to it. It's a real shame that he has, as of yet, not handed that mutation down to somebody else. Yeah. He also seems very reluctant to. Because in this world, in this water world, that's what needs to happen. If they want to survive, that's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. The entire human race needs to adapt. But that's yet another discussion for later on in the movie. (laughs) Yes. So here at the tail end of this episode, we find ourselves in a bit of a tense standoff. We're going to get more world building when we come back next time. There's exposition about a drifter's code. But before we can get too much into social discussion, we get interrupted by a couple of 'er ne'er-do-wells that are off in the distance riding jet skis. So we'll get to see how they throw a wrench into the works that we've got going on here. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tuohy, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute. And like us on Facebook by searching Mad Max Minute and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit Patreon.com slash MadMaxMin. Thank you for joining us for Episode 3 of Waterworld. See you next time.